If we addressed all the hallmarks of aging and optimized them, we would see a 30 or 40 year life extension, which is remarkable. There are a lot of these protocols that we can reintroduce into our life to essentially activate these ancient healing mechanisms. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Dr. Mark Hyman, welcome to the Commune Podcast. How are you, man? Oh, great. How are you? So good. It's it's just a thrill to see you. And I, I just have to congratulate you at the outset on your uh, <laughs> unbelievable new book. Look at that sexy stud. <laughs> <laughs> Young forever. Um, you know, this is really the Bible, the definitive book uh, on the science and, and protocols of longevity. And I, I didn't not pay him to say that. <laughs> no, no. This is, a, you, you know, I, I sometimes they say wisdom is listening to your own advice. Um, well, wisdom is also listening to your advice. And uh, I know you've written a lot of books, I think 14, maybe this is your 15th. Um, a lot of New York Times bestsellers, and I know that every book is, is special. I have three daughters; they're all special. <laughs> but <laughs> but this one feels particularly connected to your personal journey. I know you've traveled all over the world to Icaria and Sardinia, the Blue Zones, and all these other places. I look on your Topanga. Instagram, and there you, <laughs> Topanga. <laughs> We're gonna make that the the sixth Blue Zone. Um, and then you've also implemented a lot of these strategies um, that you prescribe on yourself. So, you know, you're all in. And um, I remember uh, I was a big basketball fan growing up. I loved Michael Jordan, just totally idolized him. I remember he said, 27 is the perfect age because it's the age where your mind meets your body. Uh, well, you've completely shaken the snow globe on that idea, <laughs> uh, given that you are proudly... 63 and in in better cognitive and physical shape than you've ever been in your life so yeah just well done fair. well done on everything man thank you thank you <laughs> yeah um so i'd love for you to qualify um the notion of longevity because you often say you know you're not just about adding years to your life but adding life to your years so before we get into all the juicy stuff and the protocols and the adversity memetics and all that stuff. Can you frame the broader conversation about talking about the difference between health span and lifespan? Yeah, well, it's, it's not that complicated. Most of us in the Western world and increasingly globally lose about 20% of our life to poor health at the end of our lives. That means, you know, let's say our health span is maybe 60 so up until we're 60 we may be okay and then we may spend another 20 or 30 years in poor health and that is not an inevitable part of getting older and i think most of us don't realize that we can stay vibrant and healthy and strong and fit well into our 70s 80s 90s and beyond if we know how to take care of this basic human organism <laughs> like, you know it's a biological organism like any other and it needs certain things to function well i mean you know we know more about how to take care of animals and create health for animals than we do humans and veterinarians are very good at this you know if you have a, a racehorse that's a million dollars you don't feed it mcdonald's <laughs> and fries and a coke and a big mac right you, you know exactly what it needs to do to train to be fit to optimize its performance and uh, you know, even giving a flax seeds for omega-3 fats and a nice coat. And so the body has certain requirements that you need to fulfill in order to have your health span equal your lifespan, which is the goal, right? You want to live right up into the end and then fall off a cliff. Uh, this is what we call the compression of morbidity. And even before we learned all about this fancy longevity stuff, back in the 1980, James Fries published a paper from Stanford showing that people who exercised kept their ideal body weight and did not smoke, just three simple metrics, lived far longer and better and had what we call a compression of morbidity. They died quickly, painlessly, and cheaply when they were old, as opposed to people who didn't follow those behaviors, who were overweight, smoked, didn't exercise. They actually had long, slow, expensive, painful deaths. So the goal is how do we compress the morbidity of our life, the sickness, or maybe not at all, and just go. I mean, I my friend uh, Jeff Bland, who's the you know really the father of functional medicine, tells a story of I think his grandfather 
Mason was like 98 or 99 years old or something. And he had Thanksgiving dinner with everybody and had a great meal and was really spry and alert and engaged. And he says, okay, good night, everybody. I'll see you later. It's been a nice life. I love you all. And he went to bed and that was it. He just kind of decided it was time to go out. So I think that's kind of the way to go. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we both share a collective dream that we're, you know, we're playing mixed doubles at 120. <laughs> what do you mean? Then, singles, singles, okay, singles. singles. I'm playing yeah. singles. <laughs> we're playing singles. But I was referring to a, a romantic component to yes, it as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough, fair enough. We'll play, we'll play mixed doubles when we're 120. Uh, that's a date. <laughs> that's a date, Okay. And we have a very loving relationship, and I don't mean six love. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Atul Gawande, who's a wonderful, wonderful doctor, beautiful writer, too. You know, I first got hip to this notion of health span when re reading his book. He had a graph in it that showed, you know, in the early, you know, 20th century, uh, you know, basically we would die, you know, we would be healthy, and then something would happen, and then we would die relatively quickly. And, you know, you've done an unbelievable job articulating is sort of a long limp that we have through the last 15 years of our life that's characterized by, yeah, by multiple prescription drugs and multiple chronic diseases. And obviously that results in a lot of pain and suffering for the individual, but it's way beyond the individual. It's the, the family and friends who need to care give. It's the societal expense. It's, um, you know, the dis disintegration of the nuclear family is now like the, the elders have become elderly and we often ship them off to nursing homes. And it, it's really, um, you know, it's really degraded um, the human condition. And so I think, you know, all, all of the protocols that we're going to get into are so important. It's not just about some quest for immortality, right? <laughs> this has like uh, a lot of societal dimensions as well. Um, so one of the things that you do such a great job at talking about are the conditions that are, that sit above or upstream from the chronic diseases that we're very familiar with. So diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke, cancer, cognitive de decline and dementia, but you have identified these biological conditions that underwrite many of these diseases. And can you talk about what you call that and, and what are some of the most prominent of these conditions? Well, th that's really important what you just said. And, and, and I didn't come up with this, so this is not my framework, but it is a very powerful framework for understanding aging, uh, which really flips the whole idea of disease on its head. Rather than spending billions of dollars researching how to treat the diseases of aging, like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and dementia, Scientists have now uncovered that there are, they come, they, nine was the original number, I added one, which is the microbiome, so I would say 10 hallmarks of aging, things that become disrupted, processes that are essential for health that become disrupted as we get older, that can be treated and reversed. And when you do that, you don't actually have to treat the diseases themselves, because these are upstream to those diseases. In other words, if we cured heart disease and cancer and eradicated it from the face of the planet, we might see maybe a five to seven year life extension. If we addressed all the hallmarks of aging and optimized them, we would see a 30 or 40 year life extension, which is remarkable. Wow. That means living to be 120, yeah. let's say. So we, we now know that we were kind of barking up the wrong tree when it comes to the, the work of the NIH and the National Institute on Aging. They're not studying this stuff. They're studying the disease of aging. Whereas at the same time, there's been this explosion of research funded mostly by billionaires who want to live a long time that help us uncover these underlying mechanisms. And, and when you do that, you can start to think about disease in a very different way by dealing with the root cause. Now, one of the challenges I have with the field of longevity research and science is that they focus on the hallmarks of aging as the final part of the story. If we find the drug or the intervention or the supplement or the behavioral habit that will alter the hallmarks of aging, that's what we should be doing. And I think that's important. But I also think it's important to go a step further, which is really what functional medicine's about, which is why? Why 
do we see dysfunction in the hallmarks of aging, right? How, how are they being caused? What is the cause of the hallmarks? If the hallmarks are the cause of disease and death. What are the causes of the hallmarks? And that's what I go into in Young Forever in the book. But the hallmarks are this really useful framework for thinking about how all the things that we're talking about in terms of longevity interventions work. So there are basically 10 of them. The most important one is what we call deregulated nutrient sensing. And this is really important because this is sort of a meta hallmark, let's call it, a meta framework, because it influences all the other hallmarks. And if this one's not right, it's going to be hard to fix the other ones. And this has to do with nutrition. <laughs> basically, what we're eating and how what we eat and when we eat what we eat impacts these four longevity switches that are embedded in our biology designed to keep us healthy and live a long time. And what we do in our society by the flood of starch and sugar and ultra processed food and bad fats and all the things that we do and eating all the time, they screw up these four pathways that are these longevity switches. And if we can learn to turn them in the right way or flip them to work in the right way, we can literally extend our lifespan and our health span and correct a lot of the downstream hallmarks of aging. And so, you know, the other hallmarks are related to this, but, you know, the most important one is this deregulated nutrient ascension, which detects sugar and starch and protein, and it regulates these various pathways like mTOR and insulin signaling and sirtuins and AMPK, which we can go more into. And then they, that influences all the other ones like inflammation, uh, which is rampant as we get older. Inflammaging is one of these key processes, but it's often caused by what we're eating. Um, changes in our microbiome directly affected by our diet. Mitochondrial changes or damage to our mitochondria, again, a lot related to what we're eating. Protein damage. Again, we see this because of starch and sugar. We see these glycation proteins and damaged proteins that are a big sign of aging. The increase in zombie cells or senescent cells, which often is a result of, of, of the same things that uh, deregulate all the others in nutrient sensing. Telomere shortening, changes our epigenome, the, the regulator of our gene expression, damage to DNA. Uh, and these are all things that tend to go off as we tend to do the wrong thing, eat the wrong thing, are exposed to the wrong substances and toxins, don't exercise, have too much stress. It's all mediated through these various pathways, uh, including, you know, telomeres, which I didn't mention, but telomere shortening. So once we begin to understand how these things work and why they go wrong, we can start to measure what, what's happening within each of them. We can start to optimize them and we can do so in a way that makes us not only live longer, but feel better now. Because who cares if you do something, you know, I don't, you know, I'm really not living for when I'm 120, I'm living for this moment and how good do I feel right now and what can I do? And we, we were just chatting about how you've optimized your health and you're getting better than ever at tennis. It wasn't that you didn't have the strokes, but you learned how to optimize your fitness and your biology through what you're eating and the kind of exercise you're doing. And it's, it's all actually, even at 50 plus years old, is making a difference in reversing your, your biological age and making you physiologically younger. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Just by applying a lot of the protocols that you unpack in the book, I've increased my stamina to the point where, you know, I'm out there playing, not just playing, but playing competitively and outlasting people in their 20s. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. That might be just a figment <laughs> of my imagination, but at least I, I believe it. But, you know, it's funny. Um, you talk about really living in this everlasting now in this present moment. And a lot of people don't know that I think you were originally a, uh, an Asian religion major yeah, or have yeah, a Buddhism deep, deep and, yeah. interest in there. <laughs> and obviously there's a lot about uh, embodying the present moment there, but there's also this concept of, of what I call the coincidence of opposites, that for every yin, there's a yang. And when you look inside our physiological organism, you find that everywhere too. So for example, you talk uh, about these different pathways like AMPK and mTOR. And we can get a little geeky, it's okay. But you know, what I find is that our current diet um, and our current culture sanctifies growth all the time at the expense of repair and restoration and cleanup. So can you maybe unpack how that idea 
uh, relates to these particular pathways and how these particular pathways relate sure. to longevity. It's sort of a just general principle of nature. There's day and night, there's seasons, there's, you know, uh, <laughs> there, there's all these different patterns in nature that are about rest or sort of, and, and sort of activation. And we have that in our biology too, but the problem is in our culture, we just go, 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 we eat, 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 we don't do anything to kind of reset our systems. And what's really striking about this longevity science and what it really is fundamental of functional medicine is that it's about the science of creating health. It's about the science of actually activating our body's own innate intelligence, its own healing, repair, regenerative and renewal systems, which we have embedded within us. It's like code that we don't even turn on. You know, like your your, your, let's say your word processor has so many different features. Most of them, we have no clue how they work. <laughs> and we just use it as a typewriter, which is like me. But, but if you know how to do it, it's like it's unbelievable when you start to call out different features. And so the question is, how do we call out these features built into our biology that are activating renewal, repair, regeneration, and actually reversing our biological age. That's what's so exciting. So a lot of the book is about this exact phenomenon, which is how do we have the right balance between, you know, repair, renewal, regeneration, and also build up and doing things like making muscle, which is key to longevity. Because if you just are always in the sleeping mode, well, you're not going to do anything in life. But if you're always doing and you don't sleep, well, you can't function. So it's really like that. Yeah, like we've had to find this balance between like, for example, activating mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, with proteins. So we're building proteins, including muscle. But then also, we need to activate other pathways that are about like autophagy and cleanup and all this kind yeah. of stuff, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's finding, I mean, I love your book because it really um, explores how we use our innate intelligence to cultivate that balance. It's really amazing. I think that's a, you just brought up a really important point. So a lot of the longevity researchers who are not doctors, who are academics, look at the science and go, oh, well, we want to inhibit mTOR. mTOR is bad. mTOR causes you to grow cancer and get too much bad stuff happening in your body. And you don't actually have the chance to create autophagy, which is cellular cleanup. So you want to inhibit mTOR. Well, yes, you do, but in the right time for the right length of time, but not all the time. Because if you constantly are in a state of starvation, or mimicking starvation, guess what? Your body will not function optimally over the long period of time. You're going to be able to build muscle, which is essential for longevity. So there's this paradox where, you know, you need a lot of muscle and high functioning, high quality muscle to live a long, healthy life. So you need to build muscle, which means activating mTOR. But at the same time, you need to inhibit mTOR. So you activate autophagy, which is cellular cleanup and renewal and repair which is one of the few things that's been shown to actually extend life. So if you look at animal studies, the most impactful intervention is calorie restriction, which means mimicking starvation. So you need to have this balance between activation and inhibition of mTOR. And most of these longevity scientists who are saying just be vegan or be vegetarian kind of misses the point, which is that you need to silence mTOR for periods of time. So you should definitely not eat overnight, right? So you shouldn't be eating until you go to bed and then eating until you wake up. You want to give yourself at least a 12-hour break, even 14 hours. You could do longer fast periodically for a day or three days, or some people do week-long fast. That's fine, or fasting or making diet. Those are fine to do periodically. But you also need to add in protein in the right amounts of the right quality to activate mTOR. So if you, for example, I just came back from Rwanda, and people say, oh, you know, gorillas, you know, they're vegan and look at how strong they are and they're big. And I'm like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> and they just eat vegetables. But what I didn't know, which is I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. Something's off. They eat 55 pounds of food a day. They spend half their day eating and they have intestines that are far, far larger than ours in order to process all that. So, yeah, you can be a vegan and get all the amino acids you need to build muscle if you want to eat 55 pounds of food a day. I mean, to get the amount of protein you can get a four ounce piece of chicken, you need six cups of brown rice. Now, good luck with eating six cups of brown rice if you can do it. And plus you're getting all this starch and other stuff. So you need to figure out how to activate mTOR using high quality protein. And whether you like it or not, whether it fits your ideology or not, the science is very clear on this. 
the most high quality protein that activates muscle synthesis is animal protein, whether it's whey protein or meat or chicken or fish, very, very essential. And you need lots and lots of plant protein and you need jacked up plant proteins, which means, you know, plant proteins that are either processed to, to be more concentrated or adding amino acids to those, which can help increase the leucine content, which is this really important amino acid that's very low in plant proteins. And so, you know, you, and I've seen these bodybuilders who are vegan, I'm like, what are you doing? How are you, how are you so jacked? And like, well, you know, I take all these protein powder shakes and I add all this other stuff to it, like branch chain amino acids and extra leucine. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, so you actually can do it if you, if you mix together the amino acids that you find in animal protein with plant proteins, but you have to know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. That's a great point. So really, you know, it is about finding that ideal balance for your own bio individuality. Because as you say, I watched, I watched, uh, the documentary game changers. You probably saw that. Yeah. It's yeah. like all these jacked vegan bodybuilders. And it was more like of a, say, it was more of a science fiction movie, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, so then if you're going to eat animal protein, it's really just about focusing on the quality of that protein. And, um, so before we kind of head off into adversity mimetics and, 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 um, and, uh, hormesis, there's one thing that really jumped out of the book when I read it. And, you know, there are many protocols for longevity, healthy diet and good sleep and regular exercise and de-stressing techniques, meditation, non-sleep, deep rest. Um, and, and these are somewhat conventional protocols, but obviously you have, you know, your particular lens uh, that you see them through. But right alongside all of those, you always included love and community. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I, I don't know if you remember That's the right. Tina Turner song from the 80s or 90s. What's love got to do with it? Well, what's yeah. love actually got yeah. to do with longevity, Mark? Well, you know, I just I just finished reading this article in the New England Journal of Medicine about social isolation um, and loneliness. They, they have actually have a term for it. It's, uh, it's called SIL, S-I-L, social isolation and loneliness as a medical condition. And I was like, wow. And, and uh, in this article, they, they really spoke to the, the incredible harmful effects of disconnection, isolation, and loneliness. It's a very huge predictor of death and disease. Uh, in fact, it may be it's more than some things we even think about, like smoking. So it, it's, it's for real. And when I went to the blue zones, like Sardinia and Ikari and the Koya Peninsula, what's really unique about these communities, yeah, they drink wine, but that, that's probably not why they live a long time, <laughs> is that is that they actually have very tight knit communities. They are having a sense of belonging connection. They celebrate everything together. They're, they're with each other throughout their lives. And, and this makes a huge difference in the human condition. Uh, you know, we all are, are programmed to have a need to belong, to be part of a social framework and we couldn't survive as humans. I mean, if, uh, today, you know, you can live in an apartment by yourself and, you know, call Uber Eats and basically never leave your apartment. But that's only because you have a whole world without people out there making stuff, supporting you and doing that. Historically, as a tribe, we all had to work together just, just to survive. Uh, and it's just sort of built into our DNA. And that's why altruism actually is a little bit of addictive phenomena. It's actually it stimulates the same brain pathways as heroin or cocaine or, <laughs> or uh, sugar. So, I mean, that, that's, a, that's actually a good addiction is, is serving and loving others. Um, and I think that these blue zones really characterized by these incredible deep social connections and sense of belonging and meaning and purpose and love. And, and that probably is, you know, far greater than even some of the other interventions we, we typically talk about. So that, that alone is something that is worth focusing on. If you are isolated, if you're disconnected, if you're not, you know, in deep relationships, it's really important to start to focus on forming those just as it is on forming good eating habits or exercising. And it takes time. It takes effort. It takes investment. And in our society, it's like all about emptying our email box. It's not about how do we stay connected to each other? So it's really important to make those times to, to be with friends, to find friends, to cultivate friends, to join groups, whatever it is that you need to do to, to kind of make that happen. Is it really important? Whether you're part of a bowling group or a knitting group or whatever, it has the same benefit. Yeah, it's funny. We tend to confuse culture and nature as a as a species. So, 
you know, you often hear people say, well, it's just human nature to be egocentric, to take care of themselves, to build a picket fence around their home and to, you know, accumulate goods and services for themselves. But that's actually cultural. That's not actually nature. If you really look at nature, for the overwhelming majority of human history, we were in tribes. We were in cooperation. That doesn't mean it was always peaceful, but that we actually evolved to be in connection with each other. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's true. I just, I just came back from Rwanda and I had you know, a lifelong dream after I, I met Diane Fossey, who came to Cornell and gave a talk to my biology class. And I always wanted to go see the gorillas. This was, you know, a dream of fulfilled 43 years later. And, and it was just the most awe-inspiring experience, aside from the, you know, being amazingly beautiful creatures, sitting with them. They were just so loving and so connected to each other and cuddling. I mean, they had these giant cuddle puddles of gorillas <laughs> and these little baby <laughs> gorillas climbing all over the gorillas and, and the mothers just loving their babies so beautifully. And it was, I was like, wow. And they're, they're really in these tight knit family groups. And that's exactly what, what, you know, we're meant to be. Yeah. And there's this emerging field of study known as sociogenomics. I know that, that you poke at it from time to time where there's obviously a psychological component to our connection, but there also seems to be a physiological mechanism, whether that's kind of DNA methylation or, or, or what it happens to be, but our connection right here is turning on and off different genes or gene expression. Can you kind of poke at that? What is, what is sociogenomics? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that, because I, I actually... Uh went to Haiti after the earthquake in 2010 and I, I, you know, volunteered and helped there. And it was a very powerful moving experience for me. But as part of that, I met Paul Farmer, who was really a hero of mine and someone who, who died recently is really sadly my age. And, and he understood that it wasn't, you know, better medications or surgery that was needed to treat intractable TB and AIDS in the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. It was each other. It was the power of what he called accompaniment, that we have to accompany each other to help. And so he built a network and a family of sort of neighbors and family that were community health workers. And, and that was a model that I saw so striking. And he used this model to, to deal with really intractable problems around the globe. And I, and I realized from that meeting that maybe, you know, we call chronic illness a non-communicable disease or NCDs, you know, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, they're non-communicable. But in fact, they are. They're not infectious, but they're contagious. Obesity is contagious. <laughs> if you look at the data from Christakis from Harvard and his work around obesity and looking at all the Framingham data, it was fascinating that he found that you're more likely to be overweight, about 171% more likely to be overweight if your friends are overweight than if your family's overweight. <laughs> like if your siblings are overweight, you're like 40% higher chance of being overweight. But if your friends are overweight, it's far more. And then even if your friend's friend is overweight that you've never met, you're still more likely to be overweight. So the social threads that connect us may be important, more important than the genetic threads. And I began to think about this and I actually gave lectures back in the time and I came up with this term sociogenomics, which is the power of our social networks to influence our gene expression. And I just kind of, came up with this term, but then, then I started seeing in the literature and then I started seeing, well, there's academic researchers that are actually measuring this stuff. So you're in a, a beautiful, connected, heart-centered relationship or interaction with somebody else. And then you measure gene expression. You see that you turn on all the anti-inflammatory genes. You turn on all the healing and repair systems in your body. And if you're in a stressful, divisive, conflictual relationship, you're turning on all the disease genes. That's why I never watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I was listening to the news this morning and I was like, oh my God, you know, we're in this divisive culture. We're now in Texas. There are laws that are being proposed to prevent foreigners, Chinese, Russians, Iranians, and North Koreans, which are our enemies, from buying land. And it kind of harkened back to this idea wow. that we're, we're really trying to create a world where there's the other and that we you know, kind of need the other to feel like there's some meaning or something we're doing. I don't know what, but it's really a very destructive, uh, you know, part of our society that is creating this increased division instead of connection because it's having real biological effects on us. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> for our mutual friend, uh, Gabor Mate, um, you know, talks a lot about how 
trauma-inducing events like neglect or racism or abuse um, can uh, essentially ex influence gene expression and correlate with disease. And obviously we know from Rachel Yehuda's um, uh, work that, that that can be passed down transgenerationally. Um, and But maybe the good news on this uh, on that is that if we are able to find deep forms of connection and love that we can also activate those same mechanisms um and, and pass them to our children so it's so true it's so true i mean we you know the, you're talking about epigenetics so this whole phenomenon of epigenetics is basically the idea that you know our genes are fixed we can't really change them but on top of our genes are above our genes which means epi epi means above is a, is another control mechanism sort of like the piano player on the keys the keys of your piano are the genes but the piano player can play any kind of music and so when you have a stressful event it it's it sort of marks your genes and like bookmarks in your dna that determine which genes get turned on or off and when you have a stressful experience or when your grandmother was in auschwitz or you were in some trauma in the ukraine you know that's going to be registered in your biology and be expressed in your offspring but here's the good news epigene genome is not fixed so you know, we, we, we just had this kind of lifelong debate, you know, between evolutionary theorists like like Darwin and Lamarck, who was, you know, his his sort of counterpart at the time who said that, well, you know, species are can have traits that are passed on in, in a much more rapid way. And, and they're both right. It turns out, you know, genes are right, but the epigenome is also right. And so we now can influence our epigenome and, and change our DNA methylation patterns throughout our lives. And this is actually how we measure biological age. So whether you had a right. stressful event or whether you're eating the wrong crap or not or have some toxic exposure, that's going to impact your epigenome. But when you change those things, when you change your diet, when you change your fitness and exercise program, when you get more connected and have more loving relationships, when you do all these things, it literally works through reprogramming your epigenome. So reprogramming your epigenome is the key to understanding how to unlock the secrets of longevity. And that's what a lot of the scientists are working on is how do we reprogram our epigenome? And there are there are lots of ways to do it, but a lot of the ways that that we're we really now understand are things that are accessible to all of us. It's what we eat, it's how we move, it's our mindset, our thoughts, our relationships, all these things, our sleep regulate the epigenome that we can actually influence in real time. Yeah, it's fascinating. There's this whole emerging study of epinutrition, for example of how certain adaptogenic herbs, for example, can impact uh, our, our gene expression. So it's just, a, it's what I call this era is the age of agency, just because, you know, the, the end of genetic determinism, really, and just all, all of this efflorescence of the microbiome and epigenetics and neuroplasticity, that all these ideas that, you know, we are not fixed. And what you call, we're in constant relationship to what you call the exposome. I love that word. I always exposome. learn words. Yeah, the, expo <laughs> the, expo the exposome. Yeah. Yes. The exposome, right. I always learn words when I, when I read your books. <laughs> um, that's a new one for me. And, um, and, and so, you know, we talked a little bit about how, you know, we evolved. And, you know, over hundreds of thousands of years, nature gives us great abundance but also gives us a dose of scarcity, right? And we have developed in concert with that condition and built uh, adaptive mechanisms, ancient sort of healing and repair mechanisms in harmony with those conditions that existed over hundreds of thousands of years. But then culture all of a sudden got very, very fast and uh, kind of hijacked a lot of those adaptive mechanisms, and the result is chronic disease. So in a way, um, and I'm kind of leading us into this whole world of adversity mimetics or, uh, or hormesis, because a lot of, there are a lot of these protocols that we can reintroduce into our life to um, essentially activate these ancient healing mechanisms. So I'll just start, you know, what is hormesis? or adversity memetics 
and then we can get into some of the protocols that, that you're using. It, yeah. it kind of remind, remind me of that saying, you know, when the when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I think, <laughs> yeah. you know, we've got it too soft in our culture. There's yeah, always right. an abundance of food. We don't have to move our bodies that much. We we don't really have any extremes of temperature. We always have, you know, we actually have too much light light pollution. So there's all these things that are making our lives way too easy. And and the truth is we evolved in a very uh, different environment where there was much more adversity, periods of abundance of food and periods of scarcity or starvation. Periods, where most of the time we had to move our bodies pretty regularly to get anywhere and to do anything, where we were extreme, exposed to extremes of temperature, of hot and cold. So we, we historically have these embedded systems that when things get rough, our bodies go, oh, it's a rough moment. Let me do all the things biologically that are going to make me survive, right? What can I do? I'm going to turn off inflammation. I'm going to make more stem cells. I'm going to clean up old proteins and use use recycling mechanisms to be able to build new stuff because I can't eat anything. Or I'm going to increase my antioxidant systems. I'm going to make my cognitive function sharper. I'm going to build more muscle and bone density is going to be better because I need to do these things in order to find food and survive and like get through the winter. And, and this is actually a good thing. So we, we have all these embedded healing mechanisms that we can activate through various kinds of external stresses. And so a lot of the longevity research is coming up upon this, right? So one is the most obvious form of stress is, is starvation. So calorie restriction is a form of hormesis, which is essentially the idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And what was interesting, you know, you look at the, the concentration camp survivors, they have extraordinary longevity because they went through this period of extreme starvation that seemed to activate all these longevity switching pathways in their bodies. And so I'm not saying we shouldn't you know, go into concentration camps, but when we, we do need to think about how do we optimize our way of eating and our timing of eating to mimic starvation. So how do you do that? Well, you can do time-restricted eating. So give yourself 12 hours between dinner and breakfast or maybe 14 hours, which is eating dinner at six and breakfast at eight. That's not too much of a hardship for most people. That's a 14-hour fast. You should not eat before bed. You should give yourself a break. You can do a 24-hour fast once a week if you want. You can do a longer fast once a quarter. There's lots of ways to do it for deep cleaning. But when you don't eat, it activates the body's own processes of repair, this autophagy. It activates... Uh, the inhibition of mTOR, which is what we want to do to clean up and do all these good things. So that's really important. Exercise is another form of hormesis, which is, you know, when you lift weights, which you were just talking about, you're tearing your muscles, you're injuring yourself, and you're pushing your body to do something that needs to do to repair this. It's like, oh, there's something damaged, and I better go kind of send in the repair system. So then it recruits stem cells, it recruits all these uh, proteins to actually build more muscle. So that's a really good thing. And and resistance training is one of those fundamental longevity strategies. And we were just chatting about it, but no, oh, you know, you know, you and I are both kind of tall, skinny guys. We're like, oh, I play tennis. I ride my bike. I do yoga. I'm good. You know, I'm in shape. And yeah, it's true. You're in shape, but there's different kinds of being in shape and muscle mass is the currency of longevity. When you lose muscle, you age much faster. Uh, so that's really key. There's yeah, other kinds can of I, can, I, can I ask you just about yeah. that really quickly? Because this is something that I'm on my dad about all the time. He, because, you know, he, he walks every day, but I said, Dad, just get in the gym, you know, a few times a week and do some resistance training. Um, can you talk about what is sarcopenia and what are the threats associated with sarcopenia? Because it's so important. Yeah, well, you know, my dad uh, was you know, like late 80s and, and I noticed he was could he couldn't get up out of a chair anymore. You know, it was really tough for me to like struggle to kind of lean forward and push himself off. And I'm like, Dad, you're losing a lot of muscle. So I got him a trainer at 88 years old. And, he, <laughs> you know, it was amazing how much fitter he got. He started playing tennis more. I'm playing, I video me playing tennis with my dad at 89 years old. So, you know, it's possible. Now, what happens starting in your 30s and 40s is you start to lose muscle. And that gets progressively faster as you get older. And what happens is you could be the same weight at 65 or 55 that you were at 25, but be twice as fat. So your filet mignon muscle of youth turns into the marbled wagyu ribeye, which may be good to eat. It tastes <laughs> yummy, but it's terrible because it's a metabolic disaster. And what happens is muscle is where your metabolism is. It's where you regulate your blood sugar and hormones and so much else. So 
When you lose muscle, you get what we call sarcopenia. And it's one of the most underdiagnosed and undertreated conditions in medicine. In fact, I mean, never learned about it as a thing to even pay attention to in medicine. It's weird, but we know how to treat it. We know what causes it, basically inactivity and lack of protein. Uh, and so when you, when you lose muscle, what happens? Well, it becomes marbled. You become more insulin resistant and pre-diabetic. You become more inflamed. You have higher levels of cortisol, the stress hormone. You have lower growth hormone, which is important for repair and healing and renewal. You have lower testosterone and sex hormones. And it's sort of an unmitigated disaster. It's, it's all the stuff that goes in the wrong direction that you don't want to go in if you want to live a long, healthy life. So keeping muscle, building muscle is really a critical part of longevity, any longevity strategy. And, and it's because we have this, this sort of entropy phenomena that happens. If you don't do anything, it'll just happen. Like you, you can't avoid it, but you have to put a lot more input in. So now, you know, at 63, I have to put more input in to keep myself going at the same level or to increase more, but that's okay. I mean, it's just like an old car. If you know, if you drive a Toyota Camry, a 2023 off the lot, you can probably drive it, never change the oil for a hundred thousand miles. It's going to be fine. But you know, if you got a 1947, you know, uh, Mercedes uh, Roadster or something, you probably need a little more, a little more attention and maintenance to keep it running, but it can still go. <laughs> so <laughs> really important to not, not end up with sarcopenia. And this is where, this is where the protein conversation that we had before is really relevant is the quality of protein. Cause it, you know, in order to turn the switch to build muscle, you need a certain amount of protein, usually about 30 grams and you need high quality protein, meaning translate into two and a half grams of leucine per serving, which is almost impossible to get from pure plant proteins, whether you're eating beans and grains, nuts and seeds. If you're, unless you're eating enormous amounts, which is hard to do, it just, you can't consume that much food or that many calories. You're, you're going to have to either supplement or you're going to have to figure out a different, a different way to do it. So I think, I think it's really important to, to get that point. And, and it's, it's maybe something people don't like, but it's really true. And then the other part is you can put the protein in and it's going to help. But unless you do the resistance training, it's like putting, you know, a bunch of ingredients in a soup pot on the stove, but not turning the heat on. The exercise turns the heat on and makes the thing cook and build muscle. Yeah. I don't love, uh, quote unquote, pumping iron in the gym, but uh, I've gotten used to doing it three or four times a week now. And uh, I'm not setting any you know world records there. But what I have noticed is that my blood sugar has totally regulated. And, yes. um, and that's in combination with a, a number of other protocols. That's right. But, uh, it yes, is, we were it talking was... about that before, how your sugar was going up because you were changing yeah. your diet and you were losing muscle. And yeah, and you were trying to eat more vegan vegetarian and you're seeing that didn't actually work. And I think that's really important to pay attention to what's happening to your own body because often people's ideology gets in the way of their biology and, and you kind of pay attention to what is happening inside of you. Yeah, that's a, such a great point. So I know we talked a little bit about time restricted eating, talk a little bit about um, resistance training and exercise. So what about cold and heat? Yeah, so there's lots of other ways to have hormesis. Uh, two of the easiest ways, most accessible and least expensive for most people is hot and cold therapy. So hot therapy, if you don't have a lot of money, you can take a hot bath, really hot bath and try to stay in it for 15, 20 minutes, that'll really increase your temperature and elevate heat shock proteins and also boost your innate immune system. The heat shock proteins help to reform and properly uh, reshape damaged proteins or get rid of them, which is one of the hallmarks of aging, which is damaged proteins. And, and, uh, and you can take a sauna if you want, if you have it, a steam, I'd put a steam shower in my house 23 years ago and it, I never, it's still working. <laughs> it wasn't that expensive. I've gotten way of my money's worth. The, 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 the door of the shower is more broken than the steam shower. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so I go in there or, you know, you can get an infrared sauna blanket or you can get a small sauna and, and then you do that for up to half an hour. And that, that actually is shown to really improve longevity. In, in Finland, they've done a lot of population studies on it. I think the mechanisms are very impressive. It helps reset your heart rate availability, improves a healthier autonomic nervous system, helps you detoxify, helps increase your, your cardiovascular health, your brain health. And then you can go in an ice bath. Now, I don't have a fancy whole plunge, but I just put the cold water on it. It's in the 40s, especially in the winter in the Berkshires. And uh, it's amazing. And I'll stay in there for three, four minutes. And uh, it 
also activates brown fat, which is your metabolic engine. It helps your dopamine function, cognitive function, has all these other benefits. So hot and cold extremes are great. Now, if too much heat, you die of heat stroke. Too much cold, you get hypothermia. So it's that Goldilocks amount. Uh, and I talk about how to do that in the book. Uh, and then there's some really un other interesting things that are available, like hypoxia therapy, which is, means low oxygen. We know that people who live at high altitudes have better health in many ways and longevity, like Villa Cabamba in Ecuador. And, and there, you, you kind of stress your cells by depriving them of oxygen. And that makes your mitochondria replace themselves, build new mitochondria, build more efficient mitochondria, which is really key to healthy aging. That's one of the hallmarks of aging you need to work on. So you can do it by buying a hypoxia mask, simple, like for 50 bucks on Amazon. Athletes use it to exercise with. You can do it while you're working at your desk. It sort of creates a little oxygen starvation. But there's also machines like the Cell Gym and others that do the same thing, that take you up to Mount Everest and bring you down. Uh, and then there's uh, other therapies like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That's essentially putting yourself in a, in a tank that increases the atmospheric pressure to, let's say, two atmospheres and pumps in 100% oxygen, which is a stress to the body. <laughs> And that actually also activates all the healing and repair systems. And in some of the interesting data from Israel, they found that it increased telomeres and killed zombie cells, another one of the hallmarks of aging, uh, which are these zombie cells that go around your body spewing out inflammation and causing accelerated aging. It actually increased telomere length and killed zombie cells more than any other treatment. And this was, you know, a series of 60 different hyperbaric sessions over the course of 90 days. So we, we have all these technologies that do that. Ozone therapy as another hormesis therapy. Uh, so light therapy can be hormesis therapy. There's a, there's a lot of things we can, we can use. But uh, it, it's really important to start to incorporate these on a daily basis in your life as best you can. Yeah, so you talked about zombie cells or senescent cells, for example, um, and how detrimental that they can be to your health with, uh, as a pro-inflammatory agent. So there's all these new frontiers of longevity, for example. So one of them is senolytics, which are, um, you know, address uh, zombie cells or senescent cells. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about these, some of these treatments and therapies and drugs and protocols that are kind of on the bleeding edge of longevity, which ones have you adopted which ones uh, kind of the data is still out there yet? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or maybe you could poke at a couple of those. Sure. I mean, I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming down the pike and everybody's looking for the quick fix, but I would just say 80% of the game is what we just talked about is diet, exercise, stress management, uh, your, your sleep, your mindset, social connections, which are things that are generally free or very low cost. The third, and there are the, kind of new advances in thinking about certain supplements that could be helpful in these pathways like NMN or NR or NAD, which work on sirtuins or certain things like these senolytics like fisetin, which kills zombie cells or rapamycin, which inhibits mTOR as a drug or metformin, which works on one of the nutrient sensing pathways, AMPK. So these are all sort of in play right now. I think to me, it's a hierarchy, right? If you're saying take a little of the phytochemicals that activate these pathways like quercetin and green tea extract and things from um, broccoli like leucopharnin and uh, pomegranate derivatives like urolithin A, there's all sorts of stuff out there that I think is is meets the criteria of, you know, very promising, good research, safe, and, you know, reasonably yeah. priced, you know, it's not like getting stem cells for $40,000. So those are the kind of metrics. And then there's the drugs that people are developing. And there's senolytic drugs like, um, you know, dastinib and quercetin, but quercetin's a supplement, but dastinib's a a chemo drug. And that, they found that to be senolytic and reverse biological aging. But do you really want to take a chemo drug? <laughs> or, or there's drugs like metformin, which are now undergoing a large research trial called the TAME trial targeting aging with metformin. That's trying to assess whether it is a longevity intervention and to become approved as, a, as an FDA approved drug for longevity, which would be the first time anything's ever been approved for treating aging because aging has no, not been considered a disease until recently. And still most people don't think that. And it's, and it's not saying getting older is a disease. It's the biological phenomena that happens when we get older, that's treatable, that's a disease. And so metformin, I have certain problems with because, you know, it's been around forever since 1957. It's a diabetes drug. It helps uh, diabetes patients, but 
it does have side effects. It's got a digestive effects. It affects the microbiome in a bad way. It also uh, has effects on mitochondria, which I'm not thrilled about and long-term I'm worried about. But it does seem to reduce um, the level of insulin resistance, which is a key driver of aging. If you look at what's really driving all these age-related diseases, and you mentioned it with your own blood sugar regulation, that's the thing. If you want to you know, do two things after this whole podcast that will make the most difference, it's cut out starch and sugar or dramatically reduce it to a recreational drug and resist the strain. <laughs> if you just use those two things and nothing else, you're going to get like huge amounts of benefit. So uh, metformin has been studied for preventing progression to diabetes in the large diabetes prevention trial. And that was a trial done in the 90s where they looked at lifestyle, metformin, or nothing in a controlled trial. And the lifestyle did the best. Metformin was second best, and obviously doing nothing was nothing. But the lifestyle treatment that they used was what I would consider really a not optimal. It was a low-fat diet for diabetics or pre-diabetics, which is the worst possible thing you can do. But it still worked better than the metformin <laughs> because they got them connected and eating a little bit better, healthier foods, and even though they were low-fat, and they exercise better than metformin. So I think if you look at what's the optimized diet for regulating insulin and glucose compared to metformin, it's going to be you know, 10x or 20x the benefit as metformin? And is it worth the side effects and risks? I don't think so at this point, so I'm not recommending it. Uh, another drug that's really interesting is rapamycin. And this drug, it was discovered uh, on Rapa Nui, which is why it's called rapamycin, Rapa Nui's Easter Island, where they had those statues that who knows were dropped in by aliens. And, <laughs> and, and on there, they found a, some scientists in the 60s scraped off some compounds, and they found that it was potentially antifungal, not so great. It had some immune modulating properties. It's used in transplant medicine. And then scientists started looking at it for longevity, and they found that it inhibits mTOR. In fact, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. So literally, it's the target of this drug, which is interesting that they named it that way. And this, this compound, rapamycin, inhibits mTOR. So you know, if you took it all the time, it may not be good. But if you take it intermittently, and a lot of longevity researchers, a lot of physicians are recommending it, prescribing it, taking it themselves, trying it out. I think it's very promising. And I think there are some risks and side effects. There are rapalogs, which are different versions of rapamycin that may have less side effects. So, you know, what's the right regimen? How much? Is it, you know, six milligrams a week? Is it, you know, two milligrams three times a week for five weeks on, eight weeks off? There's all these regimens, but I, I think it is it is a very promising one. It's one that I've been experimenting with. Yeah, I mean, now a lot of people are talking about Ozempic because it's like kind of blew up on social media. And, you know, again, uh, yeah, I think that's like a, of a GLP-1 agonist, essentially, it kind of like opens up the receptor for, for GLP-1, which is a particular hormone peptide. But, um, but you know, when I kind of assess the landscape and I look at all the things that are right in our control all of the time, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, we can have these discussions and they're fascinating and they're amazing, but if we just actually execute around the core basic things that you've laid out, we're gonna get, we're gonna get so far along the journey. And, uh, and I think this is one of the things that, that the book really does a great job balancing with because it's really fascinating and for curious people that yeah, want to yeah. learn about like you science, and I, right. it's like, it's amazing. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I start to read about Yamanaka factors, yeah. which oh. is a, the, basically the ability uh, to take a somatic cell and, and essentially turn it into a pluripotent stem cell to regrow any tissue in our body. I'm like, holy shit. It, like, yeah, that's it's pretty incredible. wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's but, a little you know, sci-fi, but if it happens, it's going to be very cool because they'll it'll be able to reprogram your cells to a younger you. In summary, you know, you know, I actually texted you this this morning. I saw that. Uh, I, just, I love the <laughs> I book. That. I love, I love the book and I, you know, I, I learned so much and it, 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 it fills out the places that I don't know. And, um, and it, it it's, it's, it's geeky if you want to be geeky, but it's also very, very simple. If you really just want to kind of understand the basic level and apply a program to your own life to enhance your health span, 100%, I, I can't recommend it enough. 
Um, but I think longevity often gets kind of lumped into this attempt to cheat mortality um, and uh, to assuage this kind of fear of dying. But your afterword in this book, like I said to you on text, it should be a it should be a presidential inaugura- or inauguration address. It is <laughs> so articulate and good. Um, oh, thank so. You. I, I'm serious. I've listened to it like three times in the sauna. So <laughs> we're not texting it. Um, as I was listening to it on uh, on Audible, essentially. Um, Wait, you got my book so, on Audible already? Well, I have a little cheat way of doing it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, through, through I haven't your, even heard my book. Through your public. Your, yeah. Actually, um, I loved it. I love the way you read it because it's uh, like we're having a very jovial kind of upbeat conversation here. But you read it... Um, really beautifully it was like in a really sort of calm and rounded and warm inviting kind of way <laughs> thank you, Anyways, thank I, you. I, I loved your voice on it and i love that you took the time to actually read it yourself yeah i um, did i did i think i had covid um, when i read that book i didn't know I had... <laughs> well maybe, maybe that's why it was a more sub- slightly more subdued. <laughs> like subdued, but, yeah. um but you know how is the pursuit of health span bigger than an individual quest. Well, when you think about it, historically, elders in a society were the wisdom keepers. Um, and they were the pastors on of knowledge, tradition, you know, wisdom that that informed the generations that were coming after them. And we've we really lost that. We've lost our elders. We've lost the this transmission from you know, the old to the young. And you look at what's happening in the youth today. I mean, we have sort of so much of our of our youth are struggling with depression, anxiety. Suicide is a leading cause of death. I mean, I think second leading cause of death in teenage boys. I mean, it's it's frightening. And it's because we've lost the initiations, the rituals, uh, and the understanding and the wisdom that comes with being older. Now, sometimes people are older and they're same old, they're same old screwed up person they were when they were 20. And I've seen that for sure. But what we, what we learned actually from doing, you know, really deep uh, macroeconomic analyses of the impacts of what would cost to society, what would be the benefit to society of extended healthy life, not extended life, but extended healthy life, right? Because if we extend life and people are sick and old and frail, well, it's going to cost a lot more to society. But like James Freeze, like I mentioned, the compression of morbidity, you know, we, we see people who can have a long health span and a lifespan. And when you look at that data, for one year of healthy life extension, we'll see a $37 trillion benefit to society. If you do that for a 10-year life extension, which is really within the realm of current science and possibility, you're talking about a 330 or 367 trillion dollar benefit. And that's amazing because of all the additional contributions and the value we bring and the and you know right now at a point in my life where I'm 63 I finally feel like I'm figuring stuff out and I want to be able to share that with the world and share that knowledge and experience and that wisdom in ways that help people. And so this part of life is really about giving back and about helping and and more of that is only going to be a good thing for society. Yeah, there's an old adage that I think goes, if the young knew and the old could. And um, and uh, you're bringing those two notions together. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think uh, I think it was Bertrand Russell said the youth is the youth is wasted on the young, <laughs> and I think right. there is a, there's a bit of that, you know, like if we only knew what we knew now, what I knew now when I was twenty or thirty. But I think we we can come to a society where we have, you know, a more uh, you know kind of wise and connected and and belonging society, and that and that really is going to come from including people who are are experienced, who have knowledge, who can give back, who can share. I mean, imagine if all the teachers in school were people who are experts who then decide to retire from what they were doing and then give back, right? That would be such a wonderful thing. You know, we do live in this such a polarized time. And, you know, if you look at even kind of the political extremism that we're subjected to, you know, day to day, and, and, you know, you think about the reality of what life is for so many people that wake up and they have, you know, multiple chronic diseases and can't afford, you know, their insulin and their statins and et cetera. And, um, 
And, you know, it's no wonder that people are angry and are lashing out and unable to um, always leverage their prefrontal cortex. And, 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 you know, so we see physiological inflammation spilling into societal inflammation. And I, I think that's why these lessons, you know, that, that, um, that you so eloquently deliver in the book, you know, have so many uh, tentacles and, and, and so many implications to them. So, you know, Mark, I'm just uh, so grateful for your friendship and for your counsel and for your work. Um, and again, congratulations on this book. I can't recommend it enough. You Thank know, young, you. young forever. I wrote and, that a lot um, at Topanga when just, writing uh, in commune. <laughs> I wrote a lot of it there. That's right. <laughs> and and I'm just going on my um, my reservation app and, and booked as a tennis date for Boom. the year 2050. So 20, okay, 2050. <laughs> we'll got it. Then. All right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> and maybe 2070 also. Okay. Um, all right. All right, my friend. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> yeah, and maybe next time we'll explore why tennis players actually live on average seven years longer. That'll be our next podcast. It? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I want to know why. Um, all right, Mark Hyman, I, uh, to be continued. I'll see you soon. Thanks, buddy. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.